good to see you this morning and to be good to be in your presence this morning. Um, in addition to all of the people, the dignitaries, and those who invited me and asked me to come, I also want to recognize uh, a part of the Trevecca family here, one of my good friends, uh, uh, Brandon Winstead. Uh, we did PhD together at Garrett, and certainly glad to see him. And my fiance, Frieda Hall, has already been mentioned. Um, let me begin this by just saying thank you. I um, always tell people that I've learned, my parents taught me this, that no one really has to ask you to do anything. And no one has to invite you to anything. So when they do invite you, you should be at least have the courtesy to say thank you. So I'm saying thank you. And let me also just acknowledge the fact when I walked in, um, the first thing I saw, I saw these students walking around praying over these seats that we're sitting in. And this is a powerful a testament as to what we believe and who we are and what we're all about. Uh, I am just delighted to be a part of this and to be here uh, on this day. Um, let me also say it's good to see you as students in this place of worship. Um, as I went to the restroom a few minutes ago, I, I reflected upon what I tell people in the church and I tell people in the academy, that the most important thing we do together is worship. The most important thing we do is worship. So we always, when we find time and opportunities to worship, we should do so. Well, let me just tell you something as I sort of begin and thinking about uh, preaching today. Uh, I've been on sort of an, a whirlwind movement the last 10 days or so. Uh, I was at Haley Farms outside of Knoxville in Clinton um, a week ago today uh, at a part of a faculty across the nation planning an institute uh, at Haley Farms that takes place every year that has to do with child advocacy and about justice for children. Uh, and the whole idea of understanding that everybody deserves a safe start, a moral start, a healthy uh, start in life. And being a part of that faculty, part of that planning uh, was tremendous. And, and then I had the opportunity, Brita went with me, we went to Atlanta to see my niece graduate. And if I had time to tell you about her story, that would be a sermon in itself. Uh, but I would just say this, is that it was a special time because her mother, my sister, died in 2015. And she has had to work through her way through to make sure that she was able to get the education and as an older adult, not an older adult, a younger adult. And so I never take education for granted. And it's a privilege to be educated, and it was an opportunity and a great opportunity. And then I had to go and listen to my associate preach about the attitude of gratitude on Sunday. And then I just, just returned, uh, I think yesterday, uh, from uh, Newport News in Virginia uh, and had the opportunity to, to, to do something that was very moving as part of the National Council of Churches uh, meeting there in Newport News near Hampton, Virginia. We went over to Hampton, Virginia, and uh, we spent time and had a long ceremony in lamenting and remembering 400 years of slavery, where the first Africans were brought to this country, 20 Africans brought, and we stood on that very ground, and we memorialized, uh, we remembered, we lamented, and we had a service for about three hours at that spot. Uh, people, National Council, from 35 different communions, black, white, Indian, all together, remembering and lamenting. And my mind ran back at that time, and I'm getting to the sermon as this, I think about these things. Two years before that, I was in Nigeria, and in Nigeria, I had the opportunity to go to the place uh, where uh, Africans were um, put on ships, uh, put in places and walked on the same ground that they walked on and saw some of the many things that went through. And so as I've been reflecting over these last few days, 
Uh, I cannot help but think about all of those things as I stand before you as a preacher of the gospel. So, with all of that, let us pray. Lord, be thy vision. Open our eyes that we might hear it, then see and reflect upon what you have us to hear. And we'll give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to read for you from uh, the gospel according to Luke, the ninth chapter, uh, beginning with verse 51. And my place here. The ninth chapter, beginning with verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. For, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Uh, then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And another, and another said to another, he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. And today I want to talk to you about what it does it really mean to follow Jesus. What does it really mean to follow Jesus? I grew up hearing hymns, and you're too young and probably don't hear these hymns anymore, like Come to Jesus. Jesus is calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Where he leads me, I will follow him. And then there was a hymn that I heard, I have decided to follow Jesus. The words I still hear in my head from that small member congregation in Northwest Tennessee called Boris Chapel CME Church, an invitation to, as the invitation to Christian discipleship was given at the time of worship, I heard this song, the world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. I sung these songs for a long time, but without knowing what they meant regarding following Jesus. I went to Bible studies consistently over my young adult life, but most did not challenge me to follow Jesus, although they taught much about God. I heard many, many sermons as a young adult, but very seldom did they teach me about following Jesus, although some were great in content and great in inspiration. However, when I started to study the gospel of Luke, I began to discover a greater appreciation about following Jesus. Early on in my preaching ministry, I was influenced by the writings of some of our bishops who were great writers who talked about discipleship and even gave plans for discipleship. And as I grew older and as I continued in my vocation, I wrote and I preached sermons around even this particular text for today. And then I started working for a person named Ronald Cunningham, who was my mentor. And I heard him and talk about discipleship, and I, and I read writings from him about discipleship. So when I began to pursue my first doctoral work, my project was a model of Christian education 
based on spiritual formation and Christian discipleship. My election as General Secretary of Christian Education gave me a platform to write about it. And in 2009, I began developing the discipleship curriculum that was completed in 2015. And, and I started using that and getting people in our denomination to use that, talking about discipleship. Since I become a member, I became a member of the Memphis Theological Seminary faculty, I developed courses and I taught classes about discipleship in one entitled Teaching Jesus and the others about discipleship itself. And through this process, I've come to better understand what it really means to follow Jesus. And the scripture for today is at the heart of what has led me to gain a better understanding of what it means. As a matter of fact, as I reflect upon it, I have probably preached three, four, five sermons from this text. Not the same sermon, <laughs> but the same text about following Jesus. I quote John Wesley at the beginning here today. John Wesley said, I would have you not almost, but altogether a Christian. You cannot be content with less. You cannot be satisfied with right notions, neither with harmlessness. No, not yet with barely external religion, but exact whosoever it be. Neither will you be content with just a taste of inward religion. Wesley was saying, we cannot be content with being Christians part of the way. We can't take the just enough mentality. We cannot be content with right intentions or doing no harm. We can't be satisfied with external religion, going to church, going to meetings, and being in positions. We can't be content with just a feel-good religion. We can't make religion or Christianity about just going to heaven. Every Christian's desire should be to follow Jesus. Unfortunately, few believers seriously consider what following Jesus really means. And in our text today, we find that Jesus' words and actions shed light on the high expectations he holds for all those who truly seek to be obedient to him and follow him. I know a church that financed, did great finance work and was content in its purpose and, and got the work done. But And one of the essential qualities I learned as I saw that church do that was that it was had a consistent purpose. Well, I want to say to us that in order to follow Jesus, we have to have a consistent purpose. Okay. The time had come for Jesus to begin the journey to Jerusalem in verse 9 and 51 in chapter 9, a journey that would seemingly conclude at the death on a Roman cross. He had tried to prepare his disciples, telling them that he would suffer this execution but would be raised on the third day. In fact, he said, the coming events must take place and that it's going to happen. This truth and Jesus' foreknowledge of it demonstrates the sovereignty or the leadership of God in the life of Jesus the Christ. God had one purpose for Jesus, to die on the cross for the sins of all who will believe. Jesus willingly submitted and allowed God's will to unfold. In the same way, God has a consistent purpose for our lives, to follow Jesus and to share Jesus with other people. Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. Where is your face set? As members of the Trevecca family, where is your face set? Consistently pursuing the mission of God is the first step down the path of following Jesus. The Gospel of Luke has 24 chapters. And in the ninth chapter of Luke, we hear these words about Jesus. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. What follows in Luke's gospel are more than eight chapters through 18 and the 14th verse. 
that are for the most part unique to Luke, detailing what it, what it is for Jesus to go to Jerusalem and his challenge to us as would-be followers. It is one long lesson about discipleship, one long lesson about following Jesus. As Jesus set out for Jerusalem, he, he attempted to enlarge his party. You see, the part of the consistent purpose of following Jesus always entails wanting more to join the Jesus party. After being rebuffed while trying to enter a Samaritan village, Jesus and his disciples continued on their way. They encountered a quick succession of three persons. The first offered to follow Jesus wherever he went, but Jesus discouraged him with a comment about foxes have holes and birds have nests. But Jesus having nowhere to lay his head. He, he invited the second person they met, he met, they met to follow him, and he seemed amenable to the idea, except he needed to turn to some family matter first. The third offered to follow, except that he begged off long enough to stop by his home to say farewell to every in every case, Jesus seemed to be unduly harsh, allowing that there is absolutely no excuse, absolutely nothing that must get in the way of following Jesus. There are abundant excuses why we do not follow Jesus or why our following of Jesus is less committed than it should be or why we are less than enthusiastic about following Jesus all the time or at all costs. As surely as people have excuses for why they are not involved in the life of the church, the same can be said for the shallow properties of the faith of too many people. It's too hard to be a Christian. One little sin never hurt anyone. It conflicts with what is expected me at work or at school. Those words just slip out. And on it goes. Some people have a motto. That's good enough. Whatever they set out to do, they do what is expected sometimes even more than expected, but they rarely do their best. They reach a certain point where they stop and say, that's good enough. Well, isn't it? Just good enough is never good enough. More is expected of us. Follow Jesus. I can't because, and the text lists some good ones. It's a difficult life. I have family business to tend to. I must have seen to my family first. I want to be a Christian, but not yet. I have something else I must do first. Interesting, isn't it, how often a person's excuses have to do with family. That's probably why Jesus always insisted that the kingdom must come first, that you may have to turn your back on your family, that following him might even turn brother and against brother and sister against sister. Yes. In our discipleship curriculum that I developed, the first thing that we talk about is that Jesus looks for no rivals. As surely as people make excuses, so for why they are not better Christians, better followers of Jesus, local churches make their own excuses for why they are not fully committed to bringing the kingdom into fruition. Sometimes we just simply forget whose church it is. We tend to fashion the church to our own liking. There was a church once in a town where I once lived in a small neighborhood. And when the city started to grow, it encroached upon the church's turf. Rather than batten down the hatches and try to drive the newcomers away, they threw their doors wide open and invited one and all into the Lord's house. Yes, it was the Lord's house, and they instinctively knew that, and that the church grew and prospered, and so did the Lord's work. You know, that is a big step on its way to say that it is the Lord's house. You know all of the excuses, and if you are wise, you know that they are one of them, none of them will hold up. You know that what it, who it is that has called us, and you know what God has called us to be and what God has called us to to do. Let nothing get in the way of your being the person God wants you to be and doing the things that God wants you to do. Let nothing get in the way 
of following Jesus. A first-year teacher was given the assignment of being the advisor for the high school yearbook in a rural school district. Early in the year, she gave the students the weekend assignment of coming up with a theme for their yearbook. When Monday came, they submitted their idea for the theme, and their theme was, it don't matter. Of course, their idea didn't fly, and that teacher decided it was their last year at that school system. But all too often, we hear those student sentiment echoed in the hall of excuses, it don't matter. They were wrong, of course. Not only was their grammar at fault, but it does matter. It really does matter to follow Jesus. So it takes a consistent purpose to follow Jesus. A second thing I want to say in regard to our text, it takes a Christ-centered perspective to follow Jesus. When the disciples went ahead of Jesus into Samaria to find a place to spend the night and they were rejected, they asked Jesus if they should call down fire from heaven to destroy the Samaritans. Jesus rebuked them because they did not understand his perspective. Listen, some, listen. He says in Luke 6, 27 30 through 40, 31, this is some of his perspective. But I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away from your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Maybe some of those same Samaritans would come to believe in Jesus through the evangelism of the early church. And if we read Acts, we see that happened. Christ was on his way to die for humankind, and yet they wanted to kill the very ones for whom Christ shed his blood. We don't have Samaritans today, but there are the homeless, the marginalized, the poor, the children, the widows, the orphans, the little boy and girl with snotty noses, the parents who are struggling, the disposed, the outcast of society. And Jesus' words are still valid. It is the Christ perspective to love. When human obstacles seem to prevent us from accomplishing God's will, a Christ-centered perspective enables one to view them with love and compassion rather than hatred, and anger. A Christ-like perspective allows us to see other people in the, that they too are made in the image of God. Allowing Jesus to change our hearts and lives rather than resorting to worldly means requires Christ's point of view. Seeing the loss through the eyes of Christ refocuses the true follower on a Christ centered perspective. See, Jesus' compassion led to the cross. In an unjust world, love confronts injustice. In an oppressive world, love challenges oppression. Because of this, love leads to the cross. When he broke bread with sinners and fellowship with outcasts, he drew the ire of religious gatekeepers. When in his temple he raised a ruckus over the exploitation of the poor, he upset the religious elite, and his words of dangerous liberation sealed his fate. He was betrayed and summarily executed by the state, and he decomposed in the grave for three days. That leads me to the third quality needed to follow Jesus, we must take into account a considerable price. It is about priority. As Jesus and his disciples walked down the road, three people had the opportunity to follow the Lord. However, each individual offered an excuse to delay their compliance. Why did Jesus respond so harshly toward their procrastination? He was attempting to disclose a third quality, 
about discipleship, about following Jesus. The first priority must always be obedience to him. When a person accepts Jesus as Savior and Lord, a radical shift in priorities should occur so that following him becomes the primary objective. What I teach my class in, in, in my intro class in educational ministry is that I teach them that it's easy sometimes for us to call ourselves Christian because everybody else is. Sometimes it's easy for us to even call ourselves disciples because the Bible says we're disciples. But there's a different thing to call ourselves followers of Jesus. One's relationships, one's job, one's social life, all diminish in comparison to our loyalty to Jesus. As mature Christians know, placing Christ at the top ensures that every other concern will fall into its rightful place. To be a true follower, Jesus demands that we recognize a consistent purpose, reorient our thinking to a Christ-centered perspective, and pay the considerable price of placing obedience to him as our top priority. Jesus' obedience led to his death and burial in a borrowed tomb. But Jesus shows us that there's something waiting on the other side of the tomb. Those of us who follow Jesus hold a reckless hope that death isn't the final word, and that the violence of a powerful isn't the final authority. In this era where so much trouble in the land, where there's all kinds of racism, all kinds of phobias, all kinds of fears, all kinds of uncertainties, all kinds of oppression, all kinds of things going on, what powerful truth is the spirit staring in our souls. And will speaking and enacting that truth lead us to the cross? The way of the cross isn't a heroic path. It isn't found in momentary choices of boldness, but in the long journey of compassion and love. I ask you today, have you decided to follow Jesus? Have you decided to make discipleship your consistent purpose? Have you decided to have a Christ-centered perspective? Have you decided to pay the price of obedience and follow Christ as your top priority? Jesus spent at least three years in his long march to the cross, a journey through wilderness and city, through solidarity and resistance, through prayer and silence. And if we as followers of Jesus, I are going to embrace this prophetic path. We need to embark on such a journey. Jesus' earthly ministry began with a journey of descent, a psycho-spiritual ordeal in the wilderness. From there, he consistently exposed toxic myths and structures as he stirred with compassion, as he was stirred with compassion, transgressed social boundaries, and antagonize the world. His earthly ministry ended with another sort of descent, one into the grave before he rose from the dead, incorruptible. And then he poured out his spirit upon his disciples so that we could do even greater things than him. I ask you today, Trebekah, what spirit is stirring in you today? God bless you. And God keep you is our prayer. Amen. Thanks for joining us for chapel today. Be sure to check back every Tuesday and Thursday for our next gathering.